Hello, good evening, and uh, on World Press Freedom Day, I say hello and thanks for making time for News at 10. This bulletin is coming to you live from the News Hub at Adesawe, Kanda, and Accra. We're live on 3FM uh, 92.7 and also on TV3. I'm Stephen NT. Let's first begin uh, with the day's major news highlights. The Ghana Journalists Association is demanding from the legislature and executive passage into law of the freedom to information and broadcasting bills. Both, but both arms of government have again assured Ghanaians that two bills will be passed before the end of the year. And the electroconvulsive therapy ECT department of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital is not functioning. Some machines at the laboratory have also broken down. The National Tenants Union of Ghana warns the affordable housing interventions by government transformed into social housing schemes. The union contends the price tax to such facilities do not make them accessible to the target group of low income and vulnerable persons. This is News at 10. Uh, remember, we're live, streaming live on facebook.com slash 3FM uh, uh, 927 and on news uh, on TV3. I'm Stephen Ant here. We have up next is the big one. Please stay. Welcome back. Now, the right to information is a fundamental human right guaranteed by Ghana's 1992 constitution and is recognized as a right under international conventions on human rights. The bill, when eventually passed into law, will give substance to Article 21 1F of the constitution, which states, and I quote, all persons shall have the right to information subject to such qualifications and laws as are necessary in a democratic society. So uh, let, let me uh, get you uh, some key uh, aspects of the this uh, right to information bill. Now, the RTI bill uh, was drafted in 1999. It has been reviewed in 2003, 2005, 2007, but was not presented to Parliament. Now, the first attempt at enacting the uh, law on the right to information was made when the bill was presented to Parliament in February of uh, 2010. And uh, the Attorney General then, on June 20, 25 of 2015, moved the bill for a second reading awaiting passage in Parliament. The bill, uh, as you know already, was never passed uh, before the Sith Parliament was dissolved at midnight of January uh, 6th of 2017. So these are key facts of the right to information bill which this government is promising will be passed pretty shortly and as the world uh, marks the World Press Freedom Day, the Ghana Journalist Association is demanding from the legislature and executive the passage into law of the freedom to information and broadcasting bills. But both arms of government have again assured Ghanaians the two bills will be passed before the end of the year. The world celebrates the fundamental principles of press freedom by evaluating and defending media work from attacks. The Ghana Journalists Association used the opportunity to question the legislature and executive whether they are in a dilemma in passing the freedom to information and the broadcasting bills. The minority leader in parliament, Haruna Idrisu, in addressing the question said, Parliament will not deliberately delay the passage of the two bills. He indicated the Freedom to Information Bill was at its final stages before the sixth Parliament elapsed and stressed Parliament will not legislate any bill that will censor the Ghanaian media. There is a commitment 
of a bill and a law to improve the landscape of broadcasters generally in Ghana and to regulate broadcasters and to define it within the ambit of distinguishing between community radio, commercial radio, and public service broadcasters. The Deputy Majority Leader Ajua Safo was also emphatic the legislature is optimistic in passing the bills into law, just as the executive. She stressed the executive is aware of the relevance of the bills when passed into law and will not do anything to compromise that. In as much as you want to check everybody, let's make sure that in doing so, we do not tarnish the hard end reputation of people. GJA President Afil Moni outlined some measures the association is adopting to improve the welfare of journalists. The GJA has run our plans and we are on the verge of receiving our bargaining certificates which will empower us to demand what is due us from our employers. In assessing the performance of the general media landscape, communications expert Professor Audrey Gajipo expressed dissatisfaction with the performances of the media and is of the view the passage of the bills will help sanitize the industry. We may have plenty of media, but what's the quality? And we know that, you know, there have been a lot of concerns about media ethics, media's ability to properly gather important news within their communities in order to bring it before national attention. This year's celebration is on the theme, Critical Minds for Critical Times, Media's role in advancing peaceful, just and inclusive societies. Where did they catch up, made the clue for Right, let's do some analysis. Uh, pretty shortly, we'll be speaking to uh, Professor Nana Esofi Kondia, who will be joining us on telephone. But right now, I do have in the studio Jonathan Osewus, who is a member of the Coalition on the Right to Information and the Executive Director of uh, POS uh, Foundation, POS Foundation. Perfect health center. I mean, I like the full words. How are you, Ms. Osewus? <laughs> I'm doing well, my brother. So, uh, the Right to Information Bill has been hovering in Parliament over a decade, and uh, various governments announcing commitment to pass it, but that doesn't happen. The last government uh, it couldn't pass it, and the ma majority then uh, were blaming uh, the minority for drawing it back. Do you have any expectations that under this government it will pass eventually? I think uh, if we're supposed to look at uh, history, then we are, uh, I wouldn't use the word skeptical about getting mm. it being passed, but we are, we are, we are anxiously waiting. Mm. This is because we've had several, several political rhetorics as to be going to pass the bill today, next year, tomorrow, in almost all the manifestos. Mm. And then you get uh, the previous government, including the president at that time, going on international platforms in Ghana, everywhere we are going to pass the bill, and at the end of the day... It, it doesn't pass. pass. So right. you can see that we are a bit happy for the way the minister said and gave a so, deadline so that this year... Your, your, your skepticism is, is justified, right? Uh, uh, exactly. I'll hold you briefly <laughs> and get onto the telephone lines and speak with Professor Nanea Shrufi Kondia, who is a political historian and chair of journalism at the African University College of Communication, AUCC. He's on the phone lines now. Good evening, Prof. Uh, we're honoured to have you. So the right to information bill... It has taken a while to pass in Parliament. And over the years, journalists work under different conditions that make it difficult for us to access information from the right quarters. Do you think that the continuous delay in the passage of the right to information bill into law is hampering the smooth uh, functions of the media in Ghana? Yes, I think so. And... Um the reasons are three. Politicians of, on both sides find it in their mutual interest to hold off and play the games that they are playing. Secondly, the media in this country is one that doesn't fight ever its own cause. And thirdly, we've heard, and for me, in my age and now my generation, we're fed up to the gum of our back teeth that from politicians and ministers, you can count their numbers within the recent past, the last 10 years, of this haggling about Freedom Information Act. 
all the assurances. The last was I remember, if my memory is right, is Bubbing, who told this country that it was almost there. If it wasn't him, let him forgive me. But one of them had announced, if you check your records, that, oh, we were almost there. It needed just a zip, and it would be there. Government after government, the succession of them, left and right, have played games with the journalists in this country, the, the, the media with this country, and the country at large. <laughs> because I want to tell them tonight, on the day of the celebration of International Freedom Day, for as long as they push the foot and play the kind of games that they are playing, Ghana's credentials as a democratic beacon mm. in the developing world. So, Prof, uh, the suggestion you're making is that uh, there is some kind of grand orchestration among the various political divides to store the passage of this uh, important bill into law because it favors them not to be fought with, uh, with information as far as journalists are concerned? Yes, that is very true. But having said that, you cannot accuse them all completely. The problem is that journalists themselves, you see, within that bill, there are clauses that will instigate carefulness. But the record of journalism in this country also would make anyone be more than skeptical about the information being given would be carefully, delicately handled. We've got too many examples of exuberance of journalists, young journalists and old journalists like that, playing one-upmanship with it. And it's not good for them and for the country, but for most of the time because the politicians in Parliament hold the upper, upper hand. Mm. This has been the quandary. But I want to repeat that. It is a very essential credential mm. supporting any claim by Ghana, whichever government, that we are very democratic, very liberal, and that we have this freedom of information bill right. in place. Right, Prof. So, so let me ask you, uh, before I let you go, uh, whether you're hopeful that this government uh, can pass uh, the... the, the rights information bill into law, considering that it has been bragging about uh, being the government under whose tenure the, uh, the criminal libel law was repealed? Oh, the criminal libel law cannot be, the passing of it or the repeal of it cannot be claimed by one party. It was, the, the parliament was responding at that time to the feeling of the country against it, that it had become obsolete. It is true that one man person piloted it, and that was that the person was in a government that had promised. But I'm afraid since then, governmental promises in this country, I will hold myself away from it. Right. I'm too skeptical. I have no hope. Right, uh, Professor Nana Srivikondia, we're grateful for your time. Thank you uh, very much Thank for you. joining us uh, on News at 10. I'm Stephen Antia. Professor used to be my uh, uh, news agency, <laughs> uh, war service uh, lecturer when I was at Ghana Institute of Journalism. Mr. Sewusu, the right to information bill, how important is it? Uh, basically, it uh, is to give the ordinary person access to information. For example, let's break it down to a susu collector. You come to take my loan and uh, my money in this small microfinance called susu. And I come to inquire how, how much I have deposited in my account. You have no business and, not telling me. And, but this is the situation we are going through mm. now. That is why the framers of our constitution made it clear in Article 21, Clause 1F, that we have right to access this information. The sovereign constitution again says in Article 1, Clause 1, that the sovereignty of the people of Ghana resides into the, 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 uh, the people, reside mm -hmm. with the people, in whose name and whose welfare powers of government is exercised. So I have given you money and I want, or given you an appointment and you have information and I want to come and ask, what have you used the power for? 
account to me and you tell me you can't give me so, this So let me ask this question in another way. How different do you think the practice of journalism uh, or the work of journalists will be if there was a right to information law? There will be no rumor mong or there will be limited rumor mongering. Facts and information will be quality. What do you think a companies use raw materials to do? The quality of the raw material is affect the outcome or the production. So if journalists are deprived of information, definitely we will keep on hearing what goes on all, all over. Mm. Because now what they know, what they perceive, what they think is the truth, is what they put out there. And that can cause chaos. That can destabilize the peace of our nation. If you want to know the benefit again, you know, you throw light by giving information. So if you have information, you are able to hold government accountable. And most importantly, let us make this fact clear, that it, it, this right information bill, when passed to law, it's not for the journalists alone. Then you have a lot of people called citizen journalists mm -hmm. because they can assess the information and use the information to hold various district chief executives and people in government offices accountable. Your son is in school. Mm -hmm. He comes back home with an inflated bill, boarding house. You don't have any reason to go and ask You don't why understand the breakdown and you this, cannot ask. This is what we are so talking about. this is about. the kind of situation where. So in. this is very practical to the average Ghanaian. But in, in countries or jurisdictions where the freedom of information law exists, I give example like uh, the United Kingdom and the U United States of America, you don't have unlimited access to the information. You need to apply for it. In the UK, for example, you need to put in an application and you have to be giving a certain timeline, uh, maximum 30 days for that information to be supplied to you. During that period, it's most likely the information will be vetted, will be screened before handed, being handed over to you. That is similar. And so, it's uh, similar in Ghana. Does it change anything? Uh, it's similar. Do I get information? I'm a project, uh, I'm a student. Mm. I want information to do my project work. If within 14 days I can get the information, there is nothing wrong with that. But looking at the previous bill that was introduced, it was going to take an average Ghanaian uh, not less than uh, 160 days or so, I mean half a year, to get access to that information. But the previous committee, on uh, uh, a parliamentary committee on constitutional, legal and parliamentary affairs, did quite some good job mm -hmm. that if this current gov uh, government, and for that matter, parliament, right. looks at that report, it will benefit then we should be making progress. Jonathan Osewusu, we are grateful for your time for coming. Jonathan Osewusu is a member of the Coalition of the Right to Information. And uh, uh, we'll, this is Stephen Antti and uh, this is News at 10. We have more news for you. Please stay. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, far-right candidate Marine Le Pen and centrist Emmanuel Macron have clashed over uh, their vision of France's future and ways of handling terrorism in an ill-tempered televised debate on Wednesday ahead of Sunday's runoff votes for the presidency. The two went into yesterday's debate with opinion polls showing 39-year-old Macron maintaining a strong lead of 20% points over the National Front's Le Pen of 49% for Le Pen. The uh, debate watched by millions was a last major chance to persuade voters of the merits of her program, which in included uh, cracking down on illegal immigration and ditching the euro currency. Uh, tonight I have been joined uh, via Skype uh, from Paris. Uh, there's a Michael Ketley is an international journalist with France 24, is also an international features writer and filmmaker, photographer, author and communications uh, consultant advisor. Good evening, sir. Um, thank you. We're grateful that you could join us as always. So uh, the... Good evening. The Good evening, Stephen. Great to be with you and the people of Ghana. Mm. So Marie Le Pen seems to have been doing well in the polls lately, moving from 30 to about 39%, whilst uh, Macron seemed to be uh, declining now 59% from above 65% after the first round. What have you picked up as the reasons for uh, these 
changing poll ratings for the two? Well, I think there, there are a number of factors. Uh, first of all, it's we have to be careful. The polling, presidential polling in France, is notoriously inaccurate. Uh, in the past, there have been huge swings in the in the last few days of, of a, and the and the polls haven't reflected these. So I would be very careful about making great conclusions out of these uh, swings that you're talking about. Secondly. Uh, Marine Le Pen is a very well-known entity in France, whereas Macron, Emmanuel Macron, is less well-known. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's kind of normal that we would that we would pick up on people saying they would vote for Marine Le Pen, which does not mean that she's going to gain more than 40 percent of the vote. What it simply means is that a lot of people are going to make up their minds uh, at the in the last few days. Mm. So the TV debate tonight, uh, would you say that it will have any impact at all in swaying votes either way? Well, I watched the debate, or at least I watched parts of the debate, and I would say that, yes, it could, be, because there were a number of things. For, in general, I would say it was a tie. I mean, both, uh, both candidates were able to make points. Uh, of course, the points made by Marine Le Pen are those that she's made for a very long time now as the head of the National Front, her party. Uh, and generally speaking, I would say that the people that want to vote for her will not have changed their mind against her. Mm -hmm. I don't think the debate swayed anybody to vote for Macron, who was already voting for Le Pen. However, I think that Macron, each time he goes into a situation like that, he has an opportunity to make extra points as a very valid candidate. Uh, the one thing that might hurt him tonight is at certain points he was rather condescending towards Marine Le Pen. If it had been any other woman except for Le Pen, I think this would hurt him drastically among female voters. But tonight, since it's Marine Le Pen and since she has such a hard line approach to things, I have a feeling it won't hurt him very much. But he needs to be very careful I think, how he talks to her directly. Mm. Let's take a closer look at the, the votes of the other candidates after the first round, uh, Filon and Hamon and Dupont and the rest, the percentage of votes they got. Uh, how will these voters now back either Emmanuel Macron or Le Pen? My guess is that most of those voters, if they go to the polls, will vote for Macron. It's very doubtful that Marine Le Pen will pick up that many new voters from those groups. The only wild card that I see is the, are, are the voters of uh, Mélenchon, because he specifically has said he's not going to back either candidate. So those far left voters, either they won't go to the polls if they do go to the polls, it's almost certain they won't vote for, vote for Le Pen. And among the other voters, it would be very surprising to me that Le Pen would pick up very many of those of those voters from uh, Fillon or from the socialist parties. Interesting so analysis. My interesting. What's that? Interest, I'm saying interesting analysis there, but I, I need to wrap up with you. I'm, I, I need to find out whether you, you're looking at, uh, let's say, all of our expectations in Africa and the rest of uh, the West and South Africa francophone. Uh, are we looking at an independent centrist president come Sunday or a nationalist Marine Le Pen? Well, what we're looking at, first of all, is a total shakeup of what has traditionally been the French political system, because the two major parties and the two major movements ha are not in this final round of elections. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think almost certainly you're going to see Macron elected, because almost certainly there will be a movement against Marine Le Pen, mm -hmm. as there was against her father 15 years ago. However, I think she's going to get a sizable number. She, if she surpasses 40% of the vote, this will give her immense power going into the future. 
Right, Mr. Ketley, we're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely. Thank you. Uh, Michael Ketley is an international journalist uh, with France 24 and is also an international features writer, filmmaker, photographer, author, and communications advisor. We're grateful that he joined us. And I'm Stephen Ante. That's where we we'll draw the curtains for tonight. News at 10. We're live on TV3 and live on 3 FM Nights 2.7 as well. Thanks for leaving your dial there. There is more news at 3news.com. On behalf of the crew, good night.